Hi everyone, welcome back. We're gonna begin unit six today. Um, kind of picking up where we left off, but backtracking a little bit to the era of the Civil War. But this time we're not gonna be on the East Coast, we're gonna be looking at the West and the transformations that are gonna go on in the West um, beginning in the early 1860s. And essentially we will see the closing of the West by about 1890 through early 1900. And we're looking at all the different ways in which Americans, now that they have fulfilled their manifest destiny, will transform this space that they've wanted to go to for so long. So a gentleman named Frederick Jackson Turner um, was a professor and was interested in the phenomenon of American culture and this obsession with the West. And what he found very interesting was the question, what happens when the West is no longer an unclaimed open space waiting for Americans to occupy it, but is filled? And by the census of 1890, that's exactly what had happened. You could not draw a line from the northern 49th parallel down to Mexico anymore where at some point you didn't encounter American settlement. And during the 1893 um, World's Exposition in Chicago, he was invited to be a guest speaker. And he brought this terrible news to the American people. He said that much of the culture had been based in this idea of manifest destiny. And the census had now shown that something else was going to have to replace it. So this is a small portion of the nearly two hour speech he gave. But he said, the existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession and the advance of American settlement westward explain American development. Now four centuries from the discovery of America, at the end of a hundred years of life under the constitution, the frontier has gone and with its going has closed the first period of American history. So what we're going to look at today is the manner in which the United States, in a very short period of time, really from that era of Mexican session with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, um, through the last decade of the 19th century, in a mere 40, 45 years, had turned what was great vastness into something now that no longer guaranteed opportunity. So what was going to replace it? We will see that as we go through unit six and we begin to look at industrialization, urbanization, and what will become the beginnings of modern American life. But today and what we will see in our next 6.2 lesson is essentially how this first stage of America will come to an end. A few technologies, and some of these may not seem particularly advanced by our standards today, but they are incredibly important to understanding how Americans, whether they were simply traveling out west um, or were attempting to manipulate the, man, the land to their own economic benefit, would have changed the landscape. My technology beginning on the left side of my screen. Um, this is the patent for barbed wire. Um, barbed wire fencing made it possible in a very um, cheap way to essentially close off thousands of acres if needed in order to contain cattle, horses, and other livestock. It'll be a benefit for those who are claiming large portions of land, 160 acres or more, but it will be devastating to the native people who live in the West and follow the nomadic path of the buffalo. Um, it will also create um, a tension between indigenous peoples and Americans who are settling in the West in terms of what land is open um, to each group but it was a great cost effective way of being able to fence in the west there were very few trees it was an incredibly dry place relative to the east and so for mere pennies a yard you could buy bales they literally wound this into bales which were put on trains um, and brought west and very effectively and again very cheaply made it possible for americans to claim land and maintain livestock in the West. This object is John Deere's plow. 
um, his basic steel plow of the 1830s. Um, by the 1880s, the plow will look something like this, a little more mechanized. This one actually um, can cut three furrows in the soil simultaneously. It's also meant to be hitched to a team of horses. Um, and so it was a, a more efficient and productive way of farming out west. Most farmers who went out west in the 1860s and 1870s would have had something like this, but those that had settled to become more successful would have been using this type of equipment as we get towards the 20th century. And then the last object here is a locomotive. And this steel locomotive um, looks a little bit different perhaps than trains today. Um, this one would have been coal fired and it actually has what was called a cow catcher or a buffalo catcher. Um, there at one time were millions of buffalo roaming the West. Um, and as the Transcontinental Railroad and its other subsidiary lines were built in the West, um, certainly up through the 1880s, um, buffalo were a hazard um, in order to make sure that something like this, which would have been burning at well over um, 700 degrees um, and had passengers upon it, to make sure it didn't derail, this little device was created. Um, they also kept people whose sole purpose was to ride on the train and shoot buffalo that might potentially be in the way. We'll talk more in the next lesson about um, the impact of Western expansion by whites um, and the decimation of the species. So the Mexican session, going back to 1848, what's to happen in it? Well, in Unit 5, we looked at this issue relative to slavery, and now we're going to look at it relative to economics and the indigenous people of the West. The Republican Party, if you remember, dominated Congress after the southern states seceded in 1861, mostly Democratic representatives. And Republicans, for the first time, will have four years in which they are able to put forth a very nationalistic economic agenda. Um, much of it's going to be created early on in the Civil War in 1862. The first piece is the Homestead Act, and this potentially made it possible for an individual to get at least 160 acres in what was the former Kansas, Nebraska territories. Um, and that land, if you could make it productive for five years, was yours to keep. Um, and it was a way of hopefully bringing more people into the West after the Civil War. The Moral Land Grant was created so colleges would be built that would specialize in engineering and sciences. Um, that land grant program continued well into the 20th century, um, but universities like North Carolina State University, Texas A&M, um, just to name a few, um, are all a product of that. So we're going to help the individual prosperous farmers out in the West for those who want to gain education beyond um, simple primary school. We will have um, college education. We're also going to see the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. People have been talking about it for decades, but by 1862, the seed money has been put forth, and there now is the bidding by companies to begin this great endeavor. How are we paying for all this? Pretty high tariffs. Um, in 1862, the tariff rate was on average 38% of a price of an imported good. It will be close to 46% by 1890. So the national government is going to support westward expansion in the following ways. Um, it may not be necessarily to all individuals. Certainly participating in something like the Homestead Act on an individual basis would be the national government financially supporting this development. But certainly we're going to see it in terms of the business of building the railroad. And on my screen you can see um, many of the railroads that are built um, by 1890. Um, the yellow lines on my screen represent what were the initial large projects that we would call the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, the first Transcontinental Railroad line began in Cancel Bluffs, Iowa, traveling from the west side of the Mississippi River all the way 
um, to California. There will be subsequent lines built to the north and several to the south, um, but the Union Pacific Railroad um, that will be built in the 1860s, um, this transcontinental railroad project was directly supported by the national government. Three companies originally got the bids um, to put in the railroad. They would build 10 miles of line at a time, and then they would go to the government for reimbursement once completed. Um, and as we spoke about with the Grand Administration, um, direct payment um, to companies by the national government will, especially in a time of the spoil system, encourage all kinds of graft and corruption. So the Transcontinental Railroad, um, the first line took five years to build. It begins in 1864, just before the war ended. And we will, in the end, only have two companies. The Central Pacific and the Western Pacific will actually merge about halfway through dur during this process due to financial costs. Um, but the Union Pacific built the eastern portion of the line. Um, the western portion on the far side of the Rockies, that will be built by the Central Pacific Line. And again, just to give you a sense of the amount of money the national government was reimbursing these companies, um, to build 20 miles of track over plains, essentially flat land, um, $16,000. Um, you would get $32,000 of reimbursement if you were building an elevated line, um, meaning that you were going up um, a significant elevation. Um, to build through the mountains, and much of what the Central Pacific will be building is through the mountains, um, $48,000, um, and much of that will actually be built by Chinese immigrant labor. Um, the railroad companies themselves not only got reimbursed for building these lines of track, but they also were given acreage on either side of the track. In some cases, that was only a few hundred yards. In other cases, um, it could be as much as nearly a mile of real estate. So once the railroad was put in place, they either had land to sell to others who were moving out west, or they could develop the land themselves in in terms of hotels and other businesses um, that would be needed by those who'd be traveling west. In 1869, the two points met in a place called Promontory Point, Utah, um, and the golden spike was driven through it. So railroad track is put in place um, using steel spikes, or it did at the time. Um, they created one of gold um, for ceremonial purposes to be struck um, and to put this final um, piece together. Um, Leland Stanford, there's a little college in California named after him today, um, but he was the president of the Central Pacific Railroad, um, and he will be an individual who will be very important not only to California's history after um, the Civil War, but was instrumental in being able to get this Western line of the railroad completed. So some effects. The first one is we're going to see another influx of immigrant labor, um, this time coming into the West Coast, and it will be primarily Chinese labor that was already um, had the specialized skills of mining, tunneling, um, which will be needed to get through um, the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountains. We will also see um, a lot of Irish labor that will continue to be immigrating into the United States and then coming out west um, for work. And then a lot of migrant labor, particularly freedmen. So um, young men who had either spent part of their childhood in slavery, recently free, um, were able to find actual paid labor that was much higher than what freedmen typically earned in the East. Same with the Irish. Um, it would be often hard to find work that was paid well um, in the East. They certainly could find it working on the railroad. Um, the Indian reservation system will begin to be developed. Um, this reservation system is going to be a little different than what we saw um, with the Indian Removal Act in the 1830s. Um, this reservation system is going to change quite a bit. Um, land that was um, ceded to native people as a reservation, large tracts of it, 
all over the West. Um, there will be large amounts of gold and silver found in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and so that reservation system we will see is constantly changing and moving. Um, and the amount of native land is going to considerably decrease in this time. We're also going to see some massive economic transformations. So what becomes the panic of 1873 is in part because people are speculating in all of this railroad building. Once the transcontinental railroad, that initial line is built from Iowa to Sacramento, California, there are lots of other companies um, that are also looking to build um, rail lines or you have subsidiaries, you have companies that maybe specialize in things like steel production, um, timber. They're also um, going to be companies that people invest in, um, and it'll cause some market volatility. We're also going to see a few people become incredibly wealthy from the building of railroads. Um, James Fisk and Jay Gold were two people who not only speculated in the commodities market in gold, thanks to the help of an unsuspecting President Grant, but we'll also see Leland Stanford and Cornelius Vanderbilt and his offspring benefit greatly um, by the building of railroads, not just in the West, but also in the East as well. Um, we're going to see increased trade with Japan. So in 1854, um, the United States will sign something called the Treaty of Kanagawa with Japan. And somewhat under force, um, Commodore Perry, um, who was um, a leader in the U.S. Navy, will actually bring gunboats um, to Japan in 1852, um, saying that the U.S. was looking to have um, a trading partner, um, and we will have exclusive trade with Japan as a result um, of that um, foray out the West. But we're going to see that literally by 1870, a good that had been produced in Japan, traveling across the Pacific, then traveling across the United States to the Transcontinental Railroad, that the greatest, longest part of that journey is going to be the Pacific part of the journey. Prior to building this railroad, overland travel in the United States was incredibly expensive um, and obviously took a great deal of time, months in fact. And so now we have not only connected the U.S. market, but we've connected the European market that would come primarily across the Atlantic to the east and this Pacific market to Jap Japan in the west but now also connected across the United States as well. So what we call the Great Plains, the tall grasses that exist from Iowa and essentially what is west of the Mississippi to the Rocky Mountains, so as we get to Colorado and Wyoming, this area in between, depending on what side you are of something called the 100th Meridian, you will see huge discrepancies in the amount of precipitation. So if you went out west, let's say to Missouri or Iowa, or even eastern Kansas and Nebraska in the 1850s, what you would find is that you could grow a pretty significant crop. Um, you had a little concern um, that you would have excessive drought and that would stop you from being productive as a farmer. However, if you were west of this 100th meridian, you saw a great drop off of precipitation. Um, you can see that our colors here, where you have red, you have less than five inches of precipitation a year. Um, our yellow here is probably somewhere between about 15 and 20 inches of precipitation each year. But literally, I could be just on the other side of this meridian and I could have as much as 60 to 80 inches of rain per year. And so as the federal government with the Homestead Act is encouraging people to take on land that is now west of this 100th meridian, um, not many people realize that there was such a distinct difference in precipitation. Um, and those prairies that had lots of water, incredibly productive. If you were west of this, it would be a much greater trial to be successful in the Great Plains. People who might have raised livestock, in particular cattle, um, 
and traveled and had those animals graze over a much larger area of land um, tended to do well. But if you are confined to 160 acres um, west of the 100th meridian, your chances of being successful were at about 50%. So the first people to go out, these homesteaders, as they were known, um, anybody who was male and over 21 could participate in this program. There'll be subs um, subsequent um, versions of the Homestead Act going all the way into 1910. Um, but this original program was 160 acres. And again, 50% of people who took this on were successful, and not because they didn't understand how to farm. It was typically farmers in the East who were deciding to become farmers in the West, but it was simply a much different climate and certainly much less annual rainfall. About 600,000 people attempted to take on this program, and they were known as sod busters because they built their homes of earth, literally the sod. So when you see the land west of the 100th meridian, um, very few trees grow. And the wild grasses that grow on the Great Plains um, have a very wiry and fibrous structure beneath the soil in order to hold on and collect as much rain as possible when it does in fact fall. Um, it is incredibly thick and it could be cut with a knife like this um, into four inch thick bricks um, that as you can see in this picture, people have created their homes out of. Um, this one with rainfall, you can see that the prairie itself, the plains have attempted to grow upon the roof line. Um, but this was a very challenging way of life. The people who went out there um, literally took a wagon full of items. Um, if they were lucky, they found an area where they could dig for a well and not have to dig too deep. Um, but again, it was a very, very challenging existence. The West itself, though, has been highly romanticized. And whether that's through painting, like this one by Albert Bierstadt, um, or what were once called Wild West shows, um, much like the circuses that have just recently faded from popularity. Um, you had shows where people saw men riding on horseback, all kinds of um, riding tricks, um, reenactments of Indian battles, um, people showing their um, sharpshooting abilities, um, like Annie Oakley here. Um, you even had um, Native American people well into the 20th century who were part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West traveling show. Um, but whether it's in movies or it was through the live entertainment of the day or the painting, um, people had a sense that the West was pristine, but there was a wild element about it that American ingenuity could tame and make productive. Um, and we don't talk so much about the West. The West is not really um, consumed as entertainment today, although it was well into the 1960s. Um, but that West where cowboys were middle-aged men, um, where people went to a pristine place and reshaped it as they needed, was far from the actual reality of what the West was like. There will be an extension of the Hudson River School, as we spoke about in Unit 4, that antebellum form of landscape painting that's going to move out west. Sometimes it's called the Rocky Mountain School um, because that is often um, the area of its subject matter. But Albert Bierstadt, um, who was a late Hudson River School um, painter, did a lot of work in the west. And it's how many Easterners first saw what would be the great mountain ranges um, and buffalo um, of the West. The literature that was very popular in the latter part of the 19th century, probably the most famous and one of the most successful American authors was a man named Mark Twain. Um, and he wrote about his childhood growing up on the Mississippi in the 1840s, 1850s. Um, as a young man, he went out to Nevada where they found silver um, in the 1860s. Um, and these adventures captured the American imagination, especially for people 
who were well settled in the East and were never going to actually go live in the West. Um, they took this material as what the West was like for everyone. Um, the cowboy myth, as I spoke about, um, if you watch old Westerns that occasionally show up on TV, things with John Wayne and Gary Cooper in them, um, or some of the other actors who've been known, like Clint Eastwood, um, making Westerns, they're men in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, the cowboy was most typically a young man under the age of 20. Um, sometimes they were of um, Mexican um, background, a lot of former slaves, and they were ranch hands. They helped lead these long cattle drives. Um, cattle were raised um, literally hundreds of miles from the nearest rail stop. Um, and a couple of times a year, they were pushed en masse um, in order to be sent um, to um, the East um, to be processed and become food for um, people there. But that cowboy myth is going to have a lot of resonance. Um, it's going to be seen as this individual um, an American icon, if you will, um, who in actual fact, for the most part, didn't exist. Um, but that romance of the West, as we'll see in our next lesson, um, is part of the reason why there's going to be such conflict about the fact that the West isn't empty. The West is full of indigenous people in the early 1860s, um, who unfortunately will be decimated and confined um, by 1890. So as we close out today, two things to consider. One is to what extent was the American frontier a place that promoted individualism and democracy? And then the second one is what was Frederick Jackson's frontier thesis? But again, both of these coming back to this idea that from America's earliest days, there was this belief that the American individual was going to be productive. The American individual had opportunity. And that opportunity, if nothing else, was tied to land. And it motivated much of the westward expansion that happened in the first part of the 19th century. Frederick Jackson Turner is an individual who says, all of that may have been a big part of the American psyche, and it was important. How do I believe I'm equal to any other person? Because I have the opportunity. I can participate in a democracy because of these opportunities. Frederick Jackson Turner, however, is going to tell the American public in 1893 that that ideology is gone, that there is no more available land. Um, and Americans are going to need something else to tell their children. Up until 1890, people told their sons, go west. That was where you were going to have your opportunity. Today, and certainly since the late 1890s, um, we've told people something else in terms of what you need to consider, what you need to go after in order to have the financial opportunities in the United States. And I would imagine for all of you um, who are listening to this, it's this idea of college, it's education in order to enter um, the realm of the um, affluent, hopefully one day. But where did that come from? Well, that ideology is the one that replaced the frontier and the idea that opportunity was always found in the West. <laughs>